Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk, I'm going to tell you a few stories, and then we're going to roll three times for those people who are living. <laughs> okay? So we'll still get to have your, uh, your day of reckoning. Day of reckoning is coming. Three years. 40, 44 and 45. Okay. Picture this. You've got Germany that is starting to have some issues. And they're having issues because they're not winning anymore. Okay, they're starting to lose um, on the home front. They're starting to lose everything. Because, you know, first of all, their war machine had to have it had to have people working in factories. It had to have the factories that actually standing because they're bombing them. You know, they have to be acquiring new resources, that sort of stuff, and it just doesn't seem to uh, to be going on. And they have too many fronts. Okay, when most of the war is going on, nobody is really attacking them from the west. Okay, it's the idea that we they've already taken Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Denmark, Norway, France. All of those. So there's nothing really happening there. Yes, you've got to have some sort of uh, military forces in, a, in presence there, but nobody's really attacking. Nobody is really really attacking from the south. In the west, you're dealing with, with the expansion. We're trying to do, the, the uh, Germans are trying to move into um, Soviet Union and capture Moscow. But now they've determined that because of the advancement into Soviet Union and the idea that the Soviets do something called scorched earth to where they are destroying everything, all the houses, all the crops, all everything that could possibly be utilized by the Germans before they ever get there. So the supply lines are having issues. You can't keep supplying when you're dealing with the military and dealing with the, the size you know, of this particular war. So they're having problems. So they end up having a turning point. We have Stalingrad that will be a turning point in the war with Russia. Okay. And then we'll start seeing things like North Africa will fall. North Africa will fall to the Allies. And then the Allies will move into Sicily. And then they start moving up the Italian coast to where Mussolini, who's in charge of Italy, will capitulate and he's going to go and kill him, for that matter and his government does. And then the Nazis go ahead and attack um, and take over the northern part of Italy in the process. But they've got too many fronts going on, too many wars. They can't seem to handle it. Now they also are, are dealing with this final solution, trying to get rid of the Jews, right? You know, they have, uh, they have all these, and if you start looking at your notes for 43 and 44, you'll see where a lot of, um, it, the uh, extermination camps or concentration camps will be expanded. You know, they're real happy with you know adding another crematory or two here and there, gas chambers. The idea that the Ansatzgruppe and you know those SS squads are moving still into communities with their trucks and they're loading them with either Zyklon B gas or they're using carbon monoxide from the vehicle itself to kill the individuals. They're just not doing it on mass amounts like they wanted to. Then you have then you have interesting things to come about. You have things like uh, Sweden. Sweden is a country that's neutral. Okay, but Sweden goes into places like Hungary, and they save thirty three thousand people in Hungary alone by declaring them Swedish citizens and giving them passports. Underhanded, of course. And then you have people like Oscar Schindler. Have you ever seen Schindler's List? Yeah. Hey, Schindler's List, you know, is to where this guy um, is he's basically funneling people out of the country through a business, through a factory. Okay. And um, you know, I wish things like that would have happened on a bigger, grander scale than it did. As troops from the Russians, from the Allied forces, people like that, as they start getting closer to Germany and start getting closer to those concentration camps that are outside of Germany in places like Poland or Hungary or you know anywhere else, um, the, the Germans had to think of a couple of things to do. Either you, you, know, you flee and let everybody who's there live, you kill as many people as you possibly can, in the process of leaving, 
you relocate them someplace. Okay, you put them on trains if they're still running. Or you just march them in death marches from concentration camp to concentration camp. And they did all of those things. The idea that a lot of times troops from, say, the Russians would go into a place where there was a concentration camp. Okay, and they would find dead bodies just everywhere stacked up. But then they might go into a barracks and end up finding, you know, all these emaciated, really skinny people that were in there. And then they didn't know what to do with them. I mean, what do you do with somebody who has lived, you know, for a few years, you know, under um, military rule, who are starving literally to death and waiting every day for the moment that you're taken to a crematorium, <coughs> you're taken outside and shot. You've lost all your family. Most of the time, you never saw your family again after you got to a concentration camp. So, and then think about the idea that what if there was a, a you know, Jewish person who survived the war and they were from Berlin? Okay, where do they go? You know, you go into a concentration camp and you're like, hey, you're free. You know, where do they go? They go back to a city that's been obliterated, that's been bombed to rubble. Or the idea that they want to retrieve their possessions that they may be, may be put in a Swiss account. Okay. And then, you know, do you see, when, when you see pictures of them in a concentration camp, do you see them with, you know, like their briefcase with all their documents to go and, and retrieve their money from a bank? No, they're there with, usually, if they've got any clothes on at all, or if they do, it's just a rag, and that's it. And that's their possessions. Everything else is gone. You know, they can't go and prove who they are. I mean, they can't buy maybe a number, you know, something like that, or they just say that they are. Um, life was not great at all, even when they, they get out of it. Or how about this? You get, say American forces go into a camp, and they're like, oh my gosh, we found all these people. They're starving to death. What would you want to do? What would you want to do? Huh? Feed them. You want to feed them. My gosh, I would be trying to, you know, I'd give them everything I had. You know, whatever you want to eat. But then they've been without food for so long <coughs> that eating all that food itself killed some. You know, your body wouldn't use to it. Or the idea that their body was so far gone they couldn't survive anyway. It's just bleak. This is not a good story in history. This is not one of those that, that's an uplifting story. You know, where, where the good outdid the evil. It's just sad. One of the reasons why I wanted you to roll dice was because I wanted you to experience the, uh, I mean, if you look at the odds, you're thinking, hey, you know, two out of six. You know, all I have to do is every time roll, you know, four numbers, you know, and I'm going to survive. But how many of you didn't survive because of that arithmetic involved? The idea that the odds are going to get you at some point. You know, that's what I want you to see. I don't want you to see that the Holocaust is funny. Because the Holocaust is not funny. You know, was I want you to... Huh? Was for Hitler. Well, wouldn't it... Uh, eventually. I wonder if he... I wonder if he regretted anything. I don't think so, because it was a maniac. Let me think he's got 420 day. Um, <laughs> oh, well. Yes, it's his birthday. Um... <coughs> Um, and Hitler itself, itself. if we go into that story, um, Hitler and Eva Braun committed suicide at the very end. Bodies burned. A lot of people who were Jewish, not Jewish, German soldiers, they fled. They tried to get out of the country, you know, if, if they could. They tried to you know, diminish their, the jobs that they had. They tried to say it was less than what they were. They tried to come up with another identity. Or they relocated to places like South America. One of the things that uh, we note that, uh, like in 1948, Israel becomes a country, an official country. We're one of the first countries that recognizes them as a, as a nation. But that would be a haven a refu where refugees that were Jewish could go. It's in the Middle East. You studied it, you know where it's located because you studied the geography. Okay? So all those people are being relocated there. One of the goals of the Israeli government, though, was to expose as many criminals, war criminals, as they possibly could. 
they're still doing that or still trying to do it. If they can find somebody who's really young that had some sort of connection with the Holocaust, you know, they would prosecute. They were prosecuting in the 70s. I remember lots of those cases where they were doing that. They were finding somebody, you know, some general that was located in Uruguay, you know, that was hiding, hiding changed his personality or changed his profile or something. Like you would on Facebook, I guess. Um, anyway. So the war ends in Europe. We end up having, um, we need to talk about Japan. <coughs> oh, I need to roll the up because we need to make sure that you live, survive, die, whatever. You're going to roll three times. Boom. Boom. You don't have to get that mode. You're just going to turn in the stars. Boom. December 7, 1941, in an attempt to make sure that the U.S. Navy never could have any sort of capability in the Pacific, that they would negotiate somehow with the Americans and we would stay out of any sort of conflict in Asia. Of course, they had hoped that they were going to destroy the aircraft carriers and you know any sort of military or naval vessels that happened to be in Pearl Harbor that day. The aircraft carriers were not. One of the things that was also different that I need to make sure that you know is that a lot of people in the military believed that the way to win a naval war would have been through battleships. And we had a massive amount of battleships that, um, that, that we were utilizing. And people believed that that was the way to go. Some people believed that the newer invention with the aircraft carriers was the way to go. Okay. The good thing, I guess, for us is that it sure did promote the idea of aircraft carriers when you're, all your battleships or a major part of your battleships are destroyed. Okay, if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know, you've probably visited the Arizona, something like that. Or if you've seen Pearl Harbor, the movie Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck, you probably you know, know what happens. Um, Japan was trying to become what they considered to be the Greater Asiatic League. They believed that they were superior. Would you get that off of your head? Because you don't need to be listening to your phones while I'm talking. The Greater Asiatic League. And they believed that they were the superior Asian race. And what their goal was, was to take you know, their forces in Japan and move their way down through Korea, Manchuria, China, Philippines, you know, all the way down to Indonesia and uh, Australia, New Zealand, some of those. One of the reasons why they wanted to do that was um, Japan is not a country that has lots of natural resources. And the natural resources that they have, because of part of their religion, they have multiple religions, and one of the aspects of it is something called Shintoism, 
and within Shinto, they believe that in everything nature, you know, should be preserved. That's why when you look at pictures of Japan, you'll see, you know, lots of pictures of like Mount Fuji, or you'll see bonsai trees, or you'll see koi, you know, uh, koi fish in big beautiful gardens and that sort of stuff. They like to keep their natural resources pretty. Of course, with a huge population of people, you can't always have that. But um, for the most part, they're trying to preserve it. They don't have petroleum. You know, they need iron ore. They, in order to be a nation that is of equal, they needed to expand. Okay? They had already gotten ticked at us. I mentioned this to you before. They had already gotten ticked at the U.S. and, and the Allied powers <coughs> following World War I when we start putting... Uh, limitations on the size of Navy that Japan could have as compared to you know what we considered advanced nations like France England and the US they were already ticked over things like that so you know they created this um, militaristic viewpoint now as a nation for us after we've been attacked we're going to uh, put a lot of our efforts into that, but our main focus again was was uh, against Hitler. But we put our focus, especially after you know we get rid of, of Hitler, and we then uh, proceed with the Japanese. Our turning point, the turning point for the Pacific War, would be Midway, and at this point we start something called island hopping. So we don't take every island that the Japanese had control of. We just take islands of strategic importance. So if you take this particular island, then it could fly out with its fighters or bombers to various other islands or land masses, and we could attack. And then if we move over here and we take this particular island, we can do the same thing. Or you can cut off the trade. Yes, you cut off the, the supply lines, and you also instill fear. Because at some point, they're getting to where they can bomb Japan. They can attack Japan. You know, the idea that they bombed Pearl Harbor, so one of the things that they wanted to do uh, was to bomb Tokyo. The bad part is, is that as, as long as we were moving and advancing, it just seemed to, to didn't matter if we bombed <coughs> large expanses of land or factories or whatever, they just still keep, kept pumping it out. You know, and still, you know, their whole society seemed to be behind a war and expansion and everything. We found that when we got to certain islands that were closer to Japan that had a Japanese heritage with it, like Okinawa or Iwo Jima, we noticed that, um, that the citizens on the island were so fearful of us that the citizens would run and jump off cliffs, commit suicide. Of course, you know about kamikaze pilots and that sort of stuff. <coughs> Even though we assume that they're committing suicide because they want to, it's called their cult. Um, and then, you know, if you have an airplane that's, then, you know, they put you in it and then they, they weld you in, you're not going to jump out. So. Wait, but they weld you in? They would weld you in. Um, yeah. Why would they do that? That's stupid. Sign me up for that. No, it, exactly. Exactly. That was a, uh, I ended up, you're, you're the first group that I remember to tell this to, but I remember uh, uh, one of the stories they used to have. Um, like grandparents or relatives or something like that that used to come in and talk for students to prevent them from having to do a project. See, I used to do an air and boat show, and students would, would create a diorama or they would create an airplane or a boat or something like that that was associated with, with World War II. You didn't have to do that if you brought in a guest speaker that was you know, a veteran or something like that. But I remember one time this, this guy was talking, and he was talking about uh, he had a friend who well, I wouldn't call him a friend, but there was a, a Japanese soldier that would talk to him. And uh, this Japanese soldier was laughing one day when they started seeing, and, and they were in, um, I want to say about in the Philippines. But at any rate, um, there were some, some uh, Air Force people that were going to do a kamikaze run. And they had some sort of religious ceremony before they went. And I remember him telling a story about this guy laughing at what an idiot because they knew what were, was going to happen. The idea that we get it in our head that you know everybody just lined up to go do those things. But they're, they're island hopping and they're making their way to Japan. 
we ended up coming up with newer technology, a newer technological device called an atomic bomb. Okay, now our new president, because our old president had died, the president that lasted forever, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he died. And his vice president at that particular time was Harry S. Truman. And Harry Truman had to deal with the issue of do we use an atomic bomb or do we not? Because this bomb was a major bomb. It would destroy a city, you know, a large city. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. August 6th and August 9th, 1945. They ended up picking targets. At first, they had contemplated targets like Tokyo. But then how do you negotiate with a government that's been destroyed? Or Kyoto, which is their symbolic religious center. You know, do you, do you hit that target? Or then does everybody become so infuriated with you, you know, that you can never settle a war? Or do you hit strategic points? You know, they hit an army, uh, an army headquarters, you know, a big army area, and then they hit a naval one. And it all depended upon the weather, too. You know, were there clouds over, that sort of thing, because they wanted to, to make sure they hit their target, because we didn't have lots of bombs. We only had a couple. But we wanted them to think that we had lots. So we dropped the bomb. One of the books that I used to have uh, students read by John Hersey was, uh, it's called Hiroshima. Or for people in other classes who just won't quit, Hiroshima. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's showing in the book, it shows a different perspective. Each chapter has basically a different viewpoint as related to the location of the bomb where it dropped. You know, from the epicenter, from the focal point, you know, all the way out. And uh, it talked about, you know, how that they saw like images of people on a wall to where, you know, just their, their the black image, you know, or the clear image, kind of behind them, where the person was, because it just obliterated it. It just, you know, uh, vaporized them. All the way to, you know, people who were you know, barely injured but saw lots of dead, and then dealing with, you know, disease and everything that comes along with radiation. Having to cope with all that. Huh? Having to cope with all that. Yeah. Seeing all that. But it's different viewpoints. And the thing that I enjoyed my students reading that for was because I like for you to see another point of view. In history, we always read or we usually hear the story from the victors, right? Who won the war and their point of view. And from an American perspective, we always hear kind of the, the patriotic viewpoint. I always like for students to get a well-rounded view that war is not pretty. In the big picture, no one wins. Unless you like get a really, 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 really big atomic bomb and be like, Poof. One of the things, too, that I found interesting is Dr. Hendrickson and I were researching the other day. And we were researching atomic bombs, nuclear bombs, all those things. And having them, you know, we were trying to think about, well, how many have actually been exploded? You know, so we're thinking, okay, each country probably tested a few. Do you remember how many there were? Two. They're like... Two. Thousand, thousand or something, something like that. Yeah, it's like two thousand bombs. I mean, they even showed on this particular map. They even showed, you know, like in Mississippi, they had done something, maybe underground. I don't yeah, know. Maybe like the United States did almost half of them. Yeah, United States. Yeah, and out territory. west or whatever, or you know, of off the coast even of California, um, you know, Hawaii, the um, French Polynesia, Tahiti, that area. The British, you know, did lots. Um, India, you, I mean, you just boom, 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 all over the map. The, the Russians, the uh, the Chinese, everything, just phenomenal. The best on the amount. The best part about our this situation with all the nuclear stuff and everything is that we have never gone to DEFCON four. With uh, the fear of of being attacked or if you're attacking. What do you no. Mean? Um, we have never actually achieved nuclear war. Yeah, with as many as that we've exploded. Yeah. Thank God. But but then you know we have some major points of interest on the globe. We have Pakistan and India that despise one another, <coughs> right next door to one another, that have nuclear weapons. You know, China's right there too. Bye. 
don't know about some of these other states, you know, whether or not they have nuclear technology or not. You know, what if Iran or North Korea gets it? What if, Nevada, gets it? what if Nevada has an underground bunker that like opens up and like? It's always Nevada. Um, anyway. So the war's over. The conflict that it causes is, is kind of interesting. One of the interesting stories, I think, dealing with the Japanese especially is China. See, China was in a civil war. They were in a civil war between those that wanted to promote the nationalist viewpoint. They, wanted, they were pro-Europeans, pro-West. And then you had some that were communists that were wanted to be China for China. Okay? Under uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong was for the communist, Chiang Kai-shek was nationalist. Okay? So they were having a civil war. And then Japan attacks, <coughs> attacks them. They combine their forces again, and then you know they're fighting against the Japanese. War's over. They start back their civil war again. They start back fighting. Uh, 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 uh. Chiang Kai-shek, he flees. He and his forces flee. <coughs> And they go to the island of Formosa, which later on becomes a country that's just off the coast of China that all of you learned with geography, called Taiwan. Called Taiwan. What? Taiwan. Now, Taiwan would be considered to be the true Chinese culture, the Chinese government that we wanted to support. So until we got to the Nixon administration, we didn't even want to acknowledge them. You know, that's red China. One of the things that helps break us out of it, if you've watched Forrest Gump, you would know. Have you watched Forrest Gump? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Remember when Forrest goes to China? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does he do? What's he play? Ping pong. Ping pong. Ping pong. That's called ping pong diplomacy. The idea of ping pong, you know, championships and, and, and everything seemed to be the icebreaker for us to talk and have communication with China. So that was kind of interesting. Yeah, you learn a lot actually from Forrest Gump. Ping pong is awesome. Anything you want to add with that, Dr. Peterson? Ping pong. Ping pong. Ping pong. Um, I think that they need to realize that Mao Zedong's power is still in China. I mean, the the current ruler of China, the current leader of the Communist Party in China, still, I mean, he makes most of his speeches based on things that, that, that he said. And he brings up his name. And Everywhere you look, they've taken out that, that old Chinese government and they've stamped the Communist Party on it. And you can't, you can't see things in China without looking at the Communist Party. Um, and their Communist Party is a different type of Communist Party than that of Russia yeah. um, or Soviet Union. Don't just assume. And they don't come off, at least not always. They, For a little while they do. Yeah, they will put up on a nice front if, they're, if, they're, if you're looking at them versus the West or the, the, you know, the democratic nations then they'll put up a united front. But between themselves, they bicker. It's kind of like a family, you know, you, you can rap about your family, but nobody else can, right? So it's kind of and like there's a color that will be associated with communism. Never forget it, it's always red. Okay, so when you hear things like, you know, in history, you'll, they'll, they'll sometimes talk about the reds, or they're talking about communists. Usually they're talking about the Soviet form of communism, but um, the reds. Even Mao Zedong, he writes a book, you have an idea what the name of the book is? The little blank book. What color was the book? Red. The little red book. And he's basically talking about his form of communism. Required reading, I'm sure. Okay. Do you have any questions about the Holocaust or the Japanese? Part in the Civil War, or even Mao Zedong or Chiang Kai-shek, anything like that. Okay, what I need you to do is I need you to make sure that you're prepared.